if it was a piece of meat shaped like a wrench, then it would be an actual sandwich. I agree. So it has to be edible on <laughs> all ends. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to Irenacast, the weekly podcast dedicated to conversations on faith and culture. We are your hosts. I'm Jeff. I'm Mona. And I'm Alan. Thank you so much for joining us this week. This week, I think we're just doing a Halloween-themed episode. We're going to talk about ghosts and spirits and whatnot in connection to that. And then our segment this week is... (laughs) I know I should have had some sound effects ready. Um, I'll make them. We've got Mona. (laughs) Uh, our segment this week is going to be called Pursuit of the Trivial, and uh, I'm excited about this one. But before we do that, we have a conversation to get to. So maybe we should start out with maybe Holly, Holly, <laughs> Halloween yeah. memories or something like that. How was a good way to start this conversation? My earliest Halloween memory, you guys, I was six years old, and we walk up to a house, and the door opens all by itself. So me and my sister are dressed like princesses, of course. And the door opens all by itself. And we're like, whoa, this is so creepy. And there, you know, there's like a, a life-size coffin next to the door. And there's lights. It's very spooky. And nobody's at the door. And we're like, what's going on? And all of a sudden, we hear something strange around like the other side of the garage of the house. And it's like, rum, 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 like that. And we we walk back out to the driveway and there's a guy walking toward us in a ski mask with an actual chainsaw. <laughs> and he's walking really slowly. And he's got this thing started up. And we're like, oh, my God. And we just run for the hills. But I'm like, you should not do that to six-year-olds. That Wait, is so Wait, was he a mean. stranger? No, he lived in the house. Him and his wife were playing tricks on the trick-or-treaters. Oh, my god! So he came around from the backside of the house. It would be <laughs> really good if I was a grown-up. But as a kid, it scared the <laughs> pants off me. Yeah, that's not appropriate. I wonder how many <laughs> murders occur on Halloween. Probably oh, a lot, right? I don't know. Sacrifices. Wow. This just really got dark, like really quick. <laughs> okay, before, before, we dark, before we go dark. Before we contemplate holiday. how many murders happen and cat sacrifices, <laughs> let's... Halloween's my favorite holiday, actually. And I've thought about this really hard lately. The reason why I think Hall- Halloween's my favorite is it's like totally s- stress-free. Thanksgiving stressful, you know, mom wakes up or somebody wakes up at 4 a.m. and puts their hands on a raw turkey. and Ew. Just, ah. just, I know, right? And ah. has to like prep. Oh, it has to be perfect. Everybody has to set the table and they all have to be wearing sweaters and whatever. And then Christmas is the same. You have to like hike into the woods and chop down a tree and decorate your house and do all these crazy things. Halloween, you just like throw a dummy out your front door and it lands on the ground and you're like ready, you know, and then you like <laughs> pour some food into a bowl and that's like feeding a dog. You just leave it on your front step and kids come. I don't know. It's great. Okay, when, when no said, stress. When, that's a good point. It's a good When yeah. you said your hands on a raw turkey, I just I had this flashback <laughs> to my what, a, a Thanksgiving a couple years ago with my family. And they, my parents got a new oven and it had this attachment where you could put like a meat thermometer in the turkey and it would like tell the oven directly. So I had to hear the phrase, Joe, did you probe the turkey like 12 times? <laughs> 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 I'm like, mom, stop saying that. She's like, what? I don't know what else to say. How else to say it? Joel, go probe the turkey. <laughs> <laughs> wow. We have already derailed. It's my right. fault. <laughs> so, do you have any amazing Halloween memory, Jeff? I do. I, I, Halloween when I was a kid was amazing. I grew up in an apartment complex, so which is perfect for kids on Halloween. Cause basically, like, it's this condensed area of people giving away candy. And this one year, this guy had just moved into the complex and he, and, and this is like pretty big complex. There's at least like 400 different apartments and it had like three different playgrounds at different locations. And it was a great place to grow up as a kid. Anyway. So this one guy had moved in and he was giving away whole candy bars. Ooh. So we're like, Oh my gosh. So we left that house and then we went and my friend and I switched costumes or mixed and matched our <laughs> costumes and then went back again because we were both wearing masks, so no one could see the face. And then we found some other friends. So basically, by the end of the night, I think I had like 15 full candy bars because we had got a group <laughs> together. And we had all kind of mixed and matched our costumes and kept going back to this one guy's house. And it's it like was the mother load. It was glorious. It was. I filled my uh, my pillowcase full of candy. Like, I could barely carry it. It was, it was amazing. And then when I got home, I did like <laughs> candy angels and all the candy. I like threw it up in the air. And it was, it was wonderful. Wait, wait. <laughs> Oh, candy angels? Like yeah. snow angels? What the heck? 
<laughs> Halloween day is great. The day after Halloween, though, I always got so sick eating all of the crap that people gave me. Like, like three candy bars in, you're like, this is great. And then like five candy bars yeah. in, you're like, what did I do to my body? No, not me. Our, our My family wasn't exactly healthy, so... <laughs> you had a high tolerance. I had, I, I had a high tolerance <laughs> for sugar. <laughs> the only time I consciously remember like wanting vegetables as a child was the day after Halloween. <laughs> like the, the next day. <laughs> I need something in my body. Did you guys ever know the person that gave out pennies or like oh. apples or toothpaste? Toothbrushes. That was the worst. Yeah. Um, Ugh. Ugh. Hey, do, do you know where trick-or-treating came from, supposedly? Uh, apparently you do. Apparently, I, I do. I absolutely do. I feel like you've been Tell itching to share some history. <laughs> I love the history of Halloween. I wrote a post like a couple years ago that explored it. it. People disagree about the origins of Halloween. There's no set historical argument, but there's a lot of ideas of where it came from. But anyway, trick-or-treating specifically, I think it started in England. Kids would go door to door on Halloween, which basically means the night before we celebrate the hollowed all saints day is november 1st that's how we get halloween so on this day before celebrating all of these deceased christians people would beg for something called soul cakes in exchange for praying for people's the other people's uh deceased family members so kids would show up to your door they'd say like little rhymes and poems one was soul soul an apple or two if you haven't an apple a pear will do one for Peter, two for Paul, three for the man who made us all. And so they would say that little cute rhyme and they'd get an apple or a pear or a soul cake. And then they would pray for your family. And some people say that those soul cakes actually became donuts. I don't know if that's a myth or not, but it's a nice thing to think about. <laughs> There's a hole in my soul. I don't know about you guys. But honestly, we should make <laughs> kids work harder for that stuff. You know? we should. And they should pray for my deceased family members. They I mean... should pray for us. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hey, so actually families, after that happened that night, families would literally set the table. They would have the fire going, but they would like protect it so it wouldn't spill out into the house. They would set empty chairs around the table. They would recite Psalm 129 and say, out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord, and they'd go to bed. And they would have all this food set out on their table so their deceased family could come to their house and have a meal. Kind of creepy. That's really cool. It's kind of like the Day of the Dead, like cultures around the world throughout time have practiced this sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, or like for burial, setting feasts and tombs so that the spirits could and the ancestors could come back and, and feast. And that's actually the traditions of Halloween, even further back into pagan roots and like Celtic traditions before it became, a you know, the Christians kind of baptized that holiday. It was Samhain in Celtic culture where they burned cattle bones and they would invite their ancestors to come back and spend time with them. So, so did Christians actually baptize Halloween? Because most of the Christians. Uh, I know yes Halloween. and no. Yes and okay. no. We're, we're talking like the 8th century, a pope in the 700s made All Saints Day November 1st and kind of assumed Samhain, that's October 31st, into their like into their tradition. So Interesting. It, it's possible that the two developed separately and they just got combined. But some people say Christians, as they always, you know, in Christian history, they will take a cultural, something of cultural significance and then just make it Christian, like unabashedly walk in and say, hey, this is now Christian, you know? So that's possible that, that that's what happened or they could have arised separately. But Well, we do that with all our holidays. Yeah. Well, that doesn't happen today. Tell We don't we don't tell our kids to not go trick-or-treating and come to our church for a harvest fest. That That's is, true. That's... Trunk or treat. <laughs> Look, hey, trunk or treat was the greatest thing for me as a kid because I didn't grow up in an apartment complex. It was out in the mountains, and the only way you could, you know, actually get candy was to go to a centralized, localized location. But yeah, when you have the option to create this little tiny community in a parking lot, instead of going and being with your neighbors, it sort of defeats the purpose of hospitality of, I don't know, the Christian impulse to be hospitable to our neighbors and you know be in our communities. Wait, why does it? Do Why that. does it defeat the purpose? Because I, I used to go to a church that did a, an epic trunk or treat. Like somebody turned their van into a giant toaster and another family turned their van into a hobbit hole and the I whole family that. dressed up like hobbits. It was incredible. They had made mini furniture for their van. It was, so that's fantastic. Like that's right? so much fun. But when it's billed as a let's do this instead of Halloween kind of thing. Like, yeah, but some people really come. don't okay. like scary stuff. I think sure. it's fine to create safe spaces if people want to do that. Why, why not? Sure. Sure, but when I know, it's, I can, but when it's like a specifically, 
we are, as a culture, we're going to create this Christian alternative and not be a part of the wider culture. That's when it starts to kind of bother. Ah, I think it's just what? one reflection <laughs> of an overall symptom that we've talked about over and over again on this podcast. Over like, and, they, and even if they did do it and it's a good place, because I agree, I think it's a good thing to have for people. I love and, it too. Um, but well, parents it's, are responsible to keep their kids safe. You know, like if you don't want your kid terrified by a chainsaw, you're going to try to keep your kids Her in a place PTSD where she is talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. no, you're right. There, mean, there is something, there is something to be said about that. That's true. But then they don't call it Halloween. Like that's the silliness of it. It's like, is that it's, it's Halloween. It's the same thing where instead of going to the door, they're coming to a trunk or they're going into a fellowship hall. Like, but we have to call it harvest fest because we call it Halloween. Like, I, well, and maybe this is just my context, but I grew up in a Pentecostal church. So Pentecostals are, you know, very spiritual. So the the Halloween idea like was always controversial, sort of like you've had you'd have people that were pretty adamant within the congregation that we, we can't do anything, not even a harvest festival like this is an evil day and discussion of angels and demons. And I mean, that was a regular part of my spiritual upbringing, say, those conversations. Up. Dressing well, up like if, vampires is a sin or something like that. Yeah, well, right. if you believe earnestly that there are demons in the world walking around and that there are evil occult forces and that's there are communities that are claiming this holiday for the devil, which some do probably more out of like trolling Christians than actually yeah. being sincere about it. But, mm -hmm. you know, like if you honestly believe that that stuff is bad and you want to live on the good side of life, then it makes sense that you'd be really wary of that. Like we don't have to believe that now if you sure. want to, but. But I've, I've heard Christians cast it in light and this is, it goes back pretty far. Um, there's some unfortunate rhetoric around it with Kirk Cameron, but I don't even want to bring that up. Um, there are some, but some you just Christians, did Alan. I you just did. had to. <laughs> He thought, said it in such a way that's okay. Th th this is this is a good point to make. There's no other place in my life where I'm going to talk about this. This might as well be it. There is the argument that Halloween was a way of dealing with the scary things in life and making them less scary. So dressing up as vampires and this and that was a way of showing that their power had been lessened over us. There's less of an attachment of fear to the things that scare us. And that goes for like a political context, too, when you have tyrants and people who oppressive governments and systems when you can gather together in a community and mock those things and like have some sort of hilarity or humor it's threatening to the power that it has over a people and so you can look at that spiritually or politically and i think that's a really good impulse i think like as christians thinking that jesus ultimately jesus is going to be the vic is the victor will be the victor in the future that oppression is not normal it's not the way the universe bends it's not the future of humanity that there's a different like vision for us i think that that's a a really cool thing to have in the conversation about halloween but kirk cameron kind of took that idea and then he started like talking about making fun of obama and like all this like weird stuff and you know the big obama head and like that's a great like you know anti-cultural political i know so it, what the hell that conversation Wait. gets co-opted yeah. by for me wrong impulses but still the underlying yeah, but that's like such a isn't that such like a, a random little segment of evangelicalism it, it, though it, it is but still the idea that like we're making we're taking the scary things and instead of i i think halloween is an antidote to the culture of avoidance i think a lot of times there are things that scare us as human beings death being probably the biggest one i'm like i don't know many people that are not scared of death and i see a lot of people that are dealing with it and it's like Halloween is finally that time where both pagans and Christians and everybody else can talk about, you know, bones and death and um, the transience of life. And of course, in the American modern contemporary spirit, we've made it less about that and more about consumption and actually avoiding thinking about death, which is really super weird. But I think that it's a good moment to talk about the transience of life and how life That's can be scary sometimes. You've convinced me. I yeah. think you argued that really well. So let me ask you guys then, do you believe in any sort of supernatural or spiritual anything that we can't see or touch or feel? In this I don't want to have this conversation. We well, this is the whole episode. <laughs> we have to have this, this conversation. This is this. what we decided. Uh, in me, there's this tension between my scholarly uh, theological mind kind of thing, I guess, like the more liberal scholarship in, in my mind. Thinking about well, Christian materialism, how there's not this like, you know, your soul and your spirit and this and that, like thinking more in terms of this world and, and like this world being holy and spiritual, not this other spiritual realm. I have that in me, 
but at the same time, there's like personal experiences that don't, I, I don't go fully there. So to talk about it, I'm just going to sound crazy and I'd rather not. Well, why, why don't we just vert? Let's just give ourselves a space to be a little crazy this yeah. week. And I say that because of course there's a tension between the rational and the, yeah. the, that's why I said, do you believe in it? You don't have to prove it. You don't even have to have a good reason for it. Sure. But like, are you prone to believe it? Cause I am prone to believe in ghosts. I'm prone to. I just want to believe in them. I think it's a cool <laughs> idea. And I've heard some really ill stories, one of which in particular I will tell you if you want to hear it because it's really good. Well, if it's ill, then I definitely want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> like okay, like so, ill in the hip hop like, sense? Like it's pretty yeah, awesome? Like it's pretty Super pretty ill, bad. guys. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't mock me for trying to cling okay, to bad. the vestiges of my youth. <laughs> 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 okay, I used to work with this guy. And he went to a family wedding. And so, you know, at the end of the wedding, they all take pictures, like the whole family together. So the whole family was on the stage. The photographers are taking pictures. The photographer has like a trigger like, to hatch to the camera. So it's like, click, click, click. These pictures are one second apart. And you can see this on the timestamp. And I've seen these pictures, okay? So the photographer's taking pictures. There's no one else in the whole church except for the family on the stage, the photographer in the church, in the pews. Click, click, click. Okay, so there's a series of photos of this whole family. There's like 40 people on the stage. You can see one second, there's a very normal looking photo, normal looking photo. And then the photo goes blurry. And in the foreground is the the perfect outline of a woman's head and shoulders, like bright light. And then the next second, the next photo is completely normal. I don't know. There, <laughs> There's no way to explain. I seen this picture. It is. It was crazy. There was no way to explain like why the camera would not be in focus. Why there'd be an outline of a woman. Okay, so then this is really where it gets really weird. The family saw this photo, and the bride and groom were like, "Oh my god, it's Aunt Mary!" Like this is a they 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 were convinced that this was a family member who had passed away a couple years before that everyone really missed and really wished could be there. Um, and so I don't know, maybe it was like an immaculate Photoshop job just to make the family feel nice, but there's no way to explain why that, that picture would be, would be there. Be sick. If someone did that, that'd be sick. That's a sick that would be gross, joke. right? Yeah. I don't think anyone would Look, do that. I have an incredible like sense of skepticism when it comes to any story about demons or angels or a youtube video of people drilling to the center of the earth and getting too close and hearing people scream but it sounds like an assembly <laughs> that's, not, high school. That's, <laughs> like, that's not real are you serious <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. oh yeah. my god how did you go from Look, my story to that <laughs> <laughs> to me it all sounds the same i'm not joking like i i am so suspicious of other people's stories which is completely ironic because like the first uh, I guess so you I'll want say, to believe your crazy 10, stories. I know, right? I want to believe mine, but I won't believe anyone else's. But the first ten, like ten years of my life, I had night terrors all the time, like really horrific stuff. And I had one experience that was like, if if I say it, it's going to sound totally crazy. But basically, I had a family member. All of my family, Mona, your family too, tried to help me. They like prayed over me. They brought in my grandparents who were Catholic and they did the sign of the cross on my forehead. The charismatics like put oil on the doorways and spoke in tongues. And the Baptists came in and read the Bible in my room. And like, <laughs> there's all these like different things to try to help me as a kid. Cause I had these horrific night terrors, but I had an aunt that told me like, Hey, the next time you have a night terror, just say the name of Jesus. And even as a little kid, I remember I was like 10 years old. I remember thinking that was a really stupid thing. Like I'd, been dealing with this my whole life and i'm just gonna say one word and it's all gonna go away well i did have this dream where there were these like two little people fighting in my kitchen one was like small and yellow one was small and red and in my mind i was associating with good and evil and the red one pushed the other one over chased me into a corner i was like cowering super afraid and this was very real to me uh i said the name of jesus and it turned into this like nasty beast with wings and eyes and all sorts of stuff shrieked in my face and like flew out my front door in my dream. And then I didn't have night terrors ever again after that. So whether it was like a psychological thing, a spiritual thing for me, it was very real and very powerful. And so when we talk about this stuff, it's like, that is kind of my background. And I've had a lot of other experiences too, but for me, it, it, it's a real thing. And so when I see other people talk about it in popular culture, it's like, oh, this is like a sweet little, you know, moment where Aunt Mary comes and visits us. It's, I don't know. It doesn't doesn't ring true to me but still how can i say that when 
I've had these really powerful experiences. Anyway, well, and that's where I'm at. Evidence for I, I mean that that's kind of what I was talking about. That when I I totally will not try to take away your experience, you know. And I what it, people have experienced what they experience, and it feels incredibly real. But what yeah. what I was trying to point to this particular story is like what happens when the immaterial seems to break into the material world, and what happens when we seem to have vested like evidence of it. You know, and and maybe the night terrors were evidence of something real going on. I don't know. That's yeah. that's what this stuff. I like exploring this stuff because, like, we really have to say at the end of the day, we don't know. We yes. don't know. I think we that's that's the key. Um, that is the key. What's what's interesting? I, I just got to make this comment before I forget. Is I feel like the last two or three episodes, Mona, you've been like the voice of. <laughs> the more conservative voice like no this is good like and it's been it's been refreshing see we just mix it up anyway aside from that well, um, it, and that's that's actually a good point to make is that there are people who are completely rational who are profession professional who even think differently but have experiences that they can't explain in light of what they know and there's a lot of people like that out there in the world there's a book called miracles that's written by an author i don't remember but he explores like the experiences people have of supernatural or miraculous stuff not just you know way away in a different country like uh, david hume once uh, made that argument but in l- legitimate places where the scientific mind uh trumps all people do have these experiences that are unexplainable and still uh the pew research did a survey in 2007 68 percent of americans believe that angels and demons are active in the world and operate 68 percent, and that's like 88% of Mormons, 87% of evangelical Christians, 87% of historically black churches. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you have like <clears throat> Jewish Americans are the most likely to disagree. Like 73% of them would say, no, there's no, mm. you know, demons or whatever. Well, but there's an interesting mixture across the world of people who do believe in the spirit world, right? Or spirit. That is needs. true. A lot of, a lot of cultural traditions and religious traditions really do hold There is kind of a spirit realm, but a lot of them, and this is what it was interesting about what you're just saying. I don't really actually believe in angels and demons, but I believe in ghosts, which is funny because I'm remembering our total opposite. I I know. Well, I'm remembering our soul episode and like, I don't want to believe that there's something that can, we we can be separated from our bodies. But I think, you know, maybe this is going to be going into a conversation about the afterlife because Mm. I think there, I think I don't know. Maybe I want to leave space for the fact that something lasts beyond us, but I don't know what that is or where, what that might do. But a lot of cultures have ancestor worship where they believe that an- the ancestors are with them, giving them guidance, giving them counsel that, you know, the Bible talks about being surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. Nobody exactly knows what that means. So maybe there is something to that. I don't know. The cloud of witnesses is the people who were martyred and died and went on before us. I think that's what they're talking about. Okay. Christians so what suffered and witnessed to the reality of why is God that different from why is that different from ancestor worship or ancestor it, it, it's not ancestor, ancestor worship yeah that's a really big part of lots of different types of religions and even the movie yeah. interstellar <laughs> the movie interstellar is ancestor worship in like a sci-fi setting <laughs> that's a really interesting point i've i've read before but yeah and i guess like is there a part of us that exists outside of time and space yeah, it, outside of finitude i don't know that gets or into are there inside. the question that needs to be asked for me theologically is like is there convincing evidence not just in the bible but in, you know in other ways too are human beings the only sentient life that we know of that god created or is it possible that there are beings in you know interstellar calls them bulk beings right things that are outside of our realm of experience is it possible that the things exist that god created it and how could you say no to that right these are one of the arguments where you can never say 100 no. no you know but at the same time like because finitude has limits. Yeah, but we, anything finite has limits. We've seen, we've seen, I've seen this whole conversation go south. I've seen people who have obvious psychological problems being said, you know, they're demon possessed and we're going to put them in a room and yell at them for an hour to try to get this demon out of them. But really, they just need mental health, like help. Right. So, so no, there, is, I, there is a side to this conversation that's like a popular adaptation that hurts a lot of people. And so for me, like, whatever we talk about, we have to be careful. And I think that's what Jeff, you were, Mona, you said it, Jeff, you kind of agreed. We have to be careful, right? Whatever kind of statements we make, this is not a realm that we're accustomed to talking about or dealing with. Right. Well, I, yeah. The mind is really powerful. Okay. So 
going back a, a little bit, I do not believe in demons or angels or this quote unquote spiritual realm. But I do believe that we encounter things that are unexplained all the times and all the time and we attach name to it, which I think is fine. Like I, I just because I don't believe in something or just because I don't think something exists, it doesn't mean that I don't think there are things that are unexplainable. And I think that part of all that is that holding that tension of I don't know, but also trying to have an explanation for it. Like, for instance, Mona, that that example that you're giving about how that whole family was really comforted by the fact that this if I was going to say just accident with the camera technology or whatever, but whatever happened, even if there's an explanation for it, the the goodness is in the fact that whatever they believe about what happened gave them comfort and made that moment that much brighter for them. And I think we, uh, <laughs> I think we, and this is going to sound funny to say, but I think we don't value enough self delusion in the sense that if we don't know what's going on, there's nothing wrong with providing a comforting explanation to give us peace and to, to, to me bring there is, but oh there's not, God. there can be problems with it. Well, <laughs> again, there, there can be problems in the sense, like what Alan's talking about, like if someone's genuinely mentally ill or all that kind of stuff, but I'm talking about scenarios in that situation, like with the wedding or whatever, that's, that's kind of beautiful. Like, do I believe that? It, could I be wrong? Yes, I could be wrong. But when we don't know if we can frame, uh, uh, and that's what we do naturally in our brain is like we fill in the gaps anyway in all kinds of different ways. Like the, what we're learning about our brain and how we retell a story over and over again reframes that story and that memory to kind of fit what we do. Like our brain kind of deceives us all the time. And I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with that. Except that there's a really good case against magical thinking as a culture. Like buying into magical thinking prevents cultures from like scientific discovery or dealing with social ills that they need to take care of, it, it can become avoidance. And like, I think that that's, but, but, and again, I agree. And no, I think that's that, a good point. I yeah. think with anything, there is that tension between, I think, I think the problem lies is if we're on either end of the force, either end of the spectrum. So if we say we don't know, and that's, we just leave it at that, that never gives us any kind of motivation to, explore and if on the other end of the thing we say nope that's what happened here this has happened that does the same thing so i think again it's holding that tension between i don't know and i have some kind of explanation and holding both loosely and being able to maneuver through that it's it's complex and i think that that's part of the part of the reason we have such a problem with that is that we cling too much to our explanations and we cling too much to the fact that we don't have explanations jeff i think what you're saying is extraordinarily helpful when it comes to dealing with the finality of death and the grief that goes with that. And I think Alan, maybe, I don't know, Jeff, is this what you're trying to say, but for me, like if, if one of my loved ones pass away, there's no way you can negotiate that scientifically. You can't bring them back. You can you have to just deal with the finality of it. You have to find a way to cope with it. And sometimes it's so painful that to, ex- that to have a comforting explanation is why, why not? What, what, what does it harm? I mean, yeah, that maybe can complicate grief processes sometimes if you tell someone to like communicate with their, their dead one, but, but co- whole cultures have devised ways to, to think about this. Like for sure. example, the day of the dead of Mexico, it's a day to celebrate those who have gone before and to even celebrate death as part of life. I and, know that more than anyone. I think that's and to like, important. to revel in it and to, and to give libations and offerings for those who've gone beyond and they and consider them still part of your family that's that's a kind of it's it's kind of ancestor worship it's kind of like keeping those people in your in your memory and really believing that they are still present but and then also way different that's way different than well, like stopping well, explanations you know what i mean well like, yeah no I, I agree but i'm saying but also but i'm saying that these a lot of these mythologies revolve around the finality of death like i i can't really think of one that doesn't so much like for example praying to saints in catholic communities um a lot of people a lot of protestants misunderstand this they think that they're praying to saints like jesus and that's idolatrous but the idea is that people who have died and gone before you now are in the presence of god and they can be an intermediary to talk to god on your behalf you know so so communicating with saints and praying to saints is incredibly consoling for a lot of people in this world you know so i I would never want to take that away from somebody if they find if they find hope in that because sometimes you just can't cope with grief unless you have a myth around it or even a myth that you really sincerely believe and so that's the difference i think i think 
what we're talking about is two different things almost. Like you're talking about ghosts and like that being a consola- consolation, like a consoling thought. I'm more talking about like demons and angels being an explanation for what happens in the world. And when we say, oh, that that happened right there, we don't understand it. So let's let's just, you know, it's a demon or an angel. And I think that that can get. That's that a cop very, out. I, but that's think, that's what I the Bible candy. did. That's what the Bible did. Be. Like the no, Bible. Okay. okay. Yes, so it does because they're explaining from what they understand something <laughs> yeah. that happened, and they're they're attaching a spiritual being to it. Which, because it's in the Bible, is that what it is? Like, is that the finality? Do we just say, well, the Bible says, and and, and obviously, okay. There's different options, right? There's different options. You can look at demon demons and angels in the Bible um, as a cultural thing. Like they thought that there were demons and angels swirling in the air, and that was a part of greek culture that was a a part of even some ancient near eastern stuff and like that was the language they spoke and so when the gospel came to humanity in the bible in jesus they spoke in the language of the people so you wouldn't say oh that person's sick from a fever because they have a virus or a bacteria or whatever you would say that person has a demon or something and you could you know exercise that demon as a healing maneuver like jesus did so you could explain all of that sort of in that way if you wanted to and a lot of people do that um, you could go a different route, like Walter Wink, he talks about evil being systemic. And so when they talk about demons specifically and like principalities and authorities of the power of the air, what they're actually articulating is evil in institutions. There are institutions that are very real things, things that arise from human culture that oppress and hurt regular people like individuals. And so those would be the powers and the authorities that need to be, you know, called back to their original purpose by Jesus. Those and I would, the- and I would agree with that. I would, but I would also disagree with that. Like, I don't think that that would, I think that's, impl- that's imposing too much of what we believe onto what they believed and say sure. that that was their intent. And at the same time, what I'm trying to say, it's kind of like Santa Claus. Like it's healthy for a kid to believe in Santa Claus. It encourages brain function and imagination and all that kind of stuff. Oh, I disagree. With, anyway, but it beca- <laughs> but it becomes super unhealthy if they're a teenager or in their early twenties and they're still waiting on Christmas Eve for Santa to get there because no, they genuinely no, 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 believe no, no. that it's going to happen. Oh no! Okay, no, I disagree on so many levels of what you just said. First of all, I don't think it's ever right to lie to your kids. It breaks trust. Second of all, it's implying that people who religiously believe in spirits and demons are not grown up yet or not civilized. So that so that was my third point. I was getting there. Another way to read it is that. Some of this is a real reflection of of things that do happen. If you can't say that there are no demons or angels, then you can't look at somebody who reads the Bible and believes that they exist. Like me, I do. I do believe angels and demons exist. I think they're bad explanations for things that happen in the world because we just don't understand what's going on. But through my own personal experiences and my reading of the Bible, like I do believe there's other created beings that are not necessarily like in our dimension or, you know, our physical world. But like that doesn't have to lead to some of the things that I've seen it lead to. So you can read the Bible and still think from Walter Wink's perspective and leave the possibility open that there are other stuff as well. Well, you know what I mean? yeah, OK, well, well I, I, to go back before, since I was disagreed with, sorry. I'd, like to, <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to <laughs> respond. Um, <laughs> well, OK, with a kid with Santa Claus, we're probably going to agree to disagree, but that's not lying. I mean. Like when you talk about like with with a child and you talk about their favorite like TV character, they talk as though that's a real person, and then you talk back to them as though it's a real person. It's not it's not lying. It's I, I think that that's too strong of a way to describe allowing your child to believe in Santa Claus to say that you're lying to your kid and you're breaking trust. Like there's, I'm sorry, that was a pretty harsh accusation. <laughs> but, well, but I've heard a couple stories of really losing faith in their parents for keeping yeah. that ruse up too long. And okay, that's but that, that's a symptom of something much deeper. I'm, I'm maybe probably maybe. I, I I would guess. Like I think that there's <laughs> there's 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 more attached to that. And again, maybe, but most likely. And then on the other end of it, like I'm not saying that someone who believes in the spiritual things is the same thing as Santa Claus. I think well, I think anyone is unhealthy if they're believing something in face of evidence. So someone who believes in angels and demons, like that's not an unhealthy thing because they're they're infantile or whatever because we don't know. But if like let's say tomorrow we have like documented proof that says like here's how everything works and then they still continue to believe. Like, I think it's fine to believe things that in in ways that when they're still an unknown, but when it becomes known that I don't think that you can make that, that okay. delineation, you know what I'm I saying? Ha- I have to say this though. I still think that like, I-, I still think that supernatural things can supervene, not supervene. That may be the wrong, wrong word. 
can happen in occurrence with regular stuff as well. We may like I, I'm not going to say you know, my car's breaking down. There's a demon that needs to be exercised out of my car. But like, for instance, <laughs> someone if someone has a sickness like there could be other there could be more importance attached to something that happens that we don't understand. Does That make sense. There could be some sort of occurrence that happens in our world that has a sort of significance that we don't quite get. And I think that that happens all over life. I think God has a life outside of me, beyond me. And I think when something happens in my life, it affects that divine life or like God's world, larger world in a way that I can't see. I mean, like, you know, when something. Yes, but once once you. Bad analogy, but like when an ant, I don't know, bites my leg and it ruins my meeting for the next day because I'm itching the whole time instead of paying attention to the presenter, that ant won't understand exactly what happens. And. I, I don't want to like tease out all the causality of that and stuff like that, but like things that happen in the world to say that like we have a scientific un- uh, understanding of why it happened, like that is a healthy thing. And I think we need to have scientific explanations for things. And I think we need to stop pushing off things. And, oh, we don't know because it's just the spiritual world. But to say well, that that has no spiritual significance or isn't tied to something like angels or demons or whatever isn't necessary. doesn't have to happen, right? You don't have to say that this could not have any spiritual significance. So. I don't know. But I'm not I, saying that either. For- All I'm saying is that if there is like You are. You said once we have an actual explanation for why something happens, it would be wrong for us to think that it it's attached to that other stuff. To you know that other saying? stuff, but yeah, but I but mean Hold on though. The scientific explanation could just be measuring the symptoms or the actual phenomena of something spiritual that's happened. Like they're not mutually exclusive. I think. That's what I'm trying to say. Agreed, and yeah. I, and I'm and I I agree with that 100. percent And I'm just saying, like on a basic level, like if I don't know, like if I if I truly believe I can I can walk through walls and like physically, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm talking about like the absurd, you and can't. I think I think we're crossing into a little bit. Like we should do a whole episode still on mental health, uh, and we're crossing into kind of like, well, what if someone, you know, someone yeah. dealing with something that's outside of the ordinary or the healthy or whatever we want to describe that. If I'm, if I, be, I can believe that I can walk through a wall, but, and maybe in the future I can with the right technology or whatever, but it's, that would be unhealthy to keep bashing through a wall because I really believe that one day I'm going to do it. So I'm talking about those like concrete, obvious examples. Yeah. Well, okay. But science, okay. Science is on, in an ongoing way, revealing to us that we don't know everything about how humans work in particular, right? We can all agree on this. For example, um, there's been some recent evidence that's come out lately. I listened to an Invisibilia episode on this, that people and animals and in between, like interspecies, exhibit stress hormones that other beings can read and that those hormones might stick around. So this might explain why some places feel creepy. I mean, somebody said something about institutions being inherently evil. And it's interesting to see like how the history of Christianity has this idea in it of like, exercising a city. Like for example, I went to Assisi in Italy where they have these beautiful frescoes of St. Francis. And there's one in particular where he's exercising the demons at Arezzo and trying, but, but it's tied to a concept of social health. And this is what's so interesting that if you, if you have an idea of, of, um, spirits and beings, um, you can kind of externalize evil and it's a tool to get rid of evil, you know, it, to yeah. the same degree that you can explain why evil might be present or why people might be treating each other badly. Okay. So anyway, if people exhibit stress hormones, they see, you can see this in a vet. Like if, if, a, if a, you bring your dog into the vet and the dog starts freaking out, the dog is reading the stress hormones, hormones uh, from all the other animals that have gone before. And once you establish like a place gets saturated with stress hormones, then it might be the case that it is kind of forever feels like a stressful place. So anyway, I want to tell another story. One Halloween in high school, me and my buds watched the movie, the others with, uh, Nicole, what's her face? Nicole Kidman. Kidman. (laughs) Yeah. And it's about ghosts, you know, who think that they're living the reality, but they realize they're ghosts. Like it is a really cool movie anyway. So we, we did that. And then we all got knives and hammers and we, we trespassed. We broke into this property near our house that had this whole urban mythology around it. Apparently in the sixties, somebody murdered somebody on the property and the house had been abandoned for 50 years. And like all the pagan and um, Satanist kids would go like do rituals there. So we get, we get there to this 
freaking creepy ass house and there's pentagrams drawn everywhere. You know, I can't believe I did this still, but I was freaked out. You know, I'm pretty susceptible to like getting flustered and scared about things. So anyway, so you kidnapped a bypasser and murdered them in a satanic ritual. Yeah, exactly. That's what happened. Okay. Well, okay. No, so this is where it gets wow. really strange. <laughs> um, this is where it gets really strange. And this is an unexplainable thing that might speak to a, a bunch of things, but it might not that I heard an audible voice telling me to get out of there. Like it was like, get out, you know? And I was like, Oh my God, we have to leave it out. So, okay. So it could have been my brain making that up. It could have been, I was reading the stress hormones or of the people around me that I was with. I was reading the stress hormones of the space or third possibility. It could have been something else, you know? And that's where like the something else space that we're fourth possibility. There was a squatter in the other room and <laughs> you were in their house and they were telling you to get out, <laughs> throw their <Yeah>. voice <laughs> possible, all possible, you know? But I think if we, I think it does flatten reality to try to just say, well, only the first two are valid. Only the first two are possible. Cause we, again, we can't know for sure. We can't know. Exactly. So, and I agree. And, and there's too many stories that are that are corroborated by people that are not given to superstition. You could just say humanity in general is just a totally superstitious species. We look for patterns in reality because that's how we've evolved, like looking for patterns to make sense of our world around us. And so we're hyperactive in creating patterns for understanding. But still, like there are people who are trained professionals to not think in those sorts of ways and still have sort of experiences like these. So you can't Gone are the days when we can say paternalistically only in the cor- dark, you know, the deepest corners of Africa are these stories about, uh, you know, spirits and stuff. There's a lot of evidence for a lot of human experience that that people do experience this kind of stuff. So you can't just dismiss it. It needs to be. And I don't think it with. should ever be dismissed unless there's valid reason to dismiss it. Unless you know what I'm saying? And like, there kind of is. I mean, like the most a, a lot of that has happened because, oh, well, I'm saying there's yeah. there, there's a good. There's a good reason to explain all this away. And part of that is there's a lot of bad that happens because people believe in de- demons and angels. I'm, I am I keep bringing that point up. But if you go on YouTube and you look up like exorcisms for, for demons and stuff, there's just so much bad out there that's so bad for people that it's hard for me to like have this conversation. I, without- I agree. But I think that You're most right. of, most of those are coming from a place where someone they're not saying I don't know. They're saying. Hundred percent. This is the reality, and they're acting in that. And I think that that goes against what we've all been talking about: is if we try to hold on to what we believe is a real explanation for something that's truly unexplainable. Okay, so you can be. So let's say you're a person of faith, and you read the like me, and you read the Bible, and you see demons and angel angels are a real thing. You can still hold on to that and say, "I believe this. This is a part of my idea of the universe." It's you know, like you said, they're hundred percent. I just know for sure these things exist. You can still have that without in a specific situation saying, you know, I know there's a demon in that person or I know there's an angel under that rock. Be- or yeah, I know exactly. Because you know what I mean, the like other that's... part of that is holding on to the idea that that mental health doesn't exist because I, the when I've seen stuff that people talk about exercising a demon and stuff, there's also almost always a connection with a disregard for psychology and neurology yeah. and that they've yeah. denied yeah. And another science. part that's yeah. real. So I'm They're saying like trying to get a schizophrenic person off their medication or exactly. something. And those are, dangerous. and those are extreme yeah. examples. Yeah. And I'm talking about in the everyday life, like, like with Mona's experience with trespassing, like, first of all, my late teens and early twenties was like, full of moments of trespassing that was like my favorite thing to do is to find these <laughs> these creepy urban myth areas in whatever area i was living and like go explore them and try to freak people out and and there are times where things that could that i couldn't explain like what happened and it could have been me just like in the moment or whatever but if i want to live the rest of my life believing that a demon scared us out of this abandoned house that's fine like it's fun and i can retell that story and it can add to you know the atmosphere okay. of halloween and for stuff you, for yeah. you it's fun i'm speaking as someone who had night terrors as a kid for 10 years for some people that fear is crippling and i I just want to say like where where this goes for me is like fear is controlling for people and it's disabling for people and and you fear for like even whole communities we talked about there are christian communities that say like you have to be so scared of this you can't participate in halloween you can't make a reference to a pop culture item of like of you know you can't talk about the twilight series because that's going to be like Oh, you're engaging with the devil. And so there, you can't there's read Harry Potter. Yeah. So the fear inculcates in people a sense of, like you said before, Mona, conformity and making people stay within these boundaries. And for me, fear is not the point of my 
religion, you know, of, of Christianity. And of, when I read the Bible, I see fear itself being excised as if it was a demon. It is going to be removed from the human heart because of the love of God and because of God's connection with humanity. And like to resort back to the whole demonologies and stuff for me is a step back when it comes to like the gospel and stuff like that. So I, I, I don't know though. Um, I think that's kind of the key is that idea of, of fear. Like if we're, you know, sticking with our theme or whatever, but this idea of fear, like when you're talking about your night terrors, your explanation or whatever is going to be framed around how do I make that moment less fearful as opposed to like what you're talking about when Christians say, don't do this, don't do this. And they're filling kids with fear. And for me, if I am yeah. in an abandoned house and I form a story about demons, to me, that takes away fear away from it because my view of demons is like this, this other thing. And it takes me into like a fictional reality of like horror movies that I don't believe, but I love to watch and, and get scared a little bit, but not fearful like that, that difference between the two. So I, and I think maybe so that's just, it just, it's just fear, fear management. Yeah, that dismantles yeah. the fear for me. And for someone, it might be heightened. And I think that just goes to yeah. the idea of Yeah, but for someone us. who's experienced that stuff exactly. like, very powerfully, it, it heightens it. And, and and you know what? I don't want to, like, close my eyes and close my ears to pain. Part of the thing that I'm learning, like, dealing with a lot of people who are dealing with death or, you know, illness, a lot of times we just don't want to think about pain. And so avoidance is, although it's like a survival tactic, sometimes it's not healthy. And so I, I want to say, like, if there are spiritually significant beings out there out beside God and things happening around us that we don't necessarily understand. Like that is a not something just to say, Oh, I just don't want to think about it. Like that's, that's a part of my makeup theologically and, and in my faith, but it's still, I don't know. That's why I said it's hard to have this conversation is it's tension for me. So and is I, there a place for fear for you? I'm, this is a question I'm thinking about during yes the last couple no. minutes. Well, so this is really kind of interesting. I don't know how much it pertains to our conversation, but I want to share it anyway. Um, I was reading a, this uh, account of emotional vulnerability and kind of a brief history in the last couple hundred years. And in the 18 and 17 and 1800s, it was medically believed that fear of illness caused illness, which is kind of interesting. That I think we're kind of circling back around to this idea that the power, the, the, the role in the mind of illnesses and like they just discovered limbic tissue in our brain, you know, like there's, we have only begun to explore the realm of this, but what they did with it in the, in the olden times was to say, well, because fear of illness causes illness or contributes to the illness or makes you susceptible and makes your immune system susceptible, then that uh, response then has to be emotional regulation. Like you can never have extreme emotions and that particularly got very gendered. Um, in thinking that men in particular could not have extreme emotions because they had to be really strong. And so vulnerability was seen as actually medically bad for you. Mm. Isn't that so interesting? That's why so, they sent people to the lakeside. When you were sick, you'd go, you know, to the lakeside and have like emotional restoration and balance. Well, not just that, but also because the people around you didn't want to live in the fear of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was more because of that, because they were afraid of sick people. Like they were afraid of the they were afraid of the fear of being sick. Does that make sense? So, so we had a really interesting relationship with fear, either in our culture, like total exploration of it, you know, and horror or like complete avoidance. But I'm wondering if like, if that's just part of the normal human experience. Yeah. I don't know. My thoughts on this are kind of half-baked. What do you guys well, think about that? Some, some fear is absolutely instructive, right? Sometimes fear leads us to take care of problems. It's a, it's a motivation tool to take care of some, a threat. I think sometimes fear is good. But sometimes like it makes us not who we are. it has power over us to change us and make us something that we aren't. Fear creates entire realities, especially in interpersonal conflict and like international conflict. Fear like brings out the worst in us sometimes. So, yeah, it's yeah. Not- we, I, I jotted that down. We should do a whole episode on fear. I think that the, all the kind of what we can attach to that. And I'm things scared. That we talk about <laughs> this, is, this is turning into a conversation on fear, isn't it? Well, hey, if you but, want to be really, really freaked out, you can look up. I posted a um, a blog post uh, maybe a year ago on some of my night terror experiences as a kid, oh, and geez. also uh, Alice in Wonderland syndrome. <laughs> this is re- they're not totally related, but I think they're connected. Like what's neuro- Alice in Wonderland neurologically. syndrome? <laughs> okay, Alice in Wonderland syndrome. I didn't expect to talk about this, but that's where uh, basically, especially in kids, you have this sense, and I still get it sometimes. You have this sense that uh, 
perception, your perception of the, the world around you changes. And it's sometimes it's for like five minutes or for a whole hour. People talk about like looking at somebody and their eyes get really big and it's like really super freaky or, you know, their hand looks really small. For me, it was a distorted sense of space. I felt like I'd look across the room and see a chair and it'd be like super, super far away. Um, you know, the wall would feel really far away and I get this really weird feeling like in my chest. And it was really scary for me as a kid. And so I think sometimes that was like trippy for me. Like I feel like night terrors maybe be connected to that. Uh, my mom like helped me work through some of that. And she's like, well, a lot of times those things weren't connected. But you know, anyway, what probably happens is there's more increased electrical activity in the brain or like blood rushing to a certain part of your brain. So it's messing with your perception. All that to say, I wrote this thing about Alice in Wonderland syndrome, my night terrors. And I uploaded a photo of a little journal I wrote in elementary school. And I'm looking back at it. And I remember having night terrors about a specific character coming up over and over. So I wrote this fanciful little journal about this character. My teacher had no idea that I was talking about my experiences of night terrors. But it's like this guy named Fred Winkle who would like come down from space and do this like, you know, he'd like eat lizards and he had like the body of like a a pig slash raptor kind of thing. And it was like, he would terrorize me at night. So I wrote this journal and I took a picture of it and I posted it up online and it's kind of scary. So if you want to freak yourself out, you can read that. It'll be in the show notes. I'm so sorry you went... (laughs) I'm so sorry you went through that, Alan. That's oh, it awesome. was bad. I used to pray to, um, I used to pray to the, the God, Jesus, the Tooth Fairy, Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, and even the Lucky Charms dude. You know, on the box of cereal, I used to pray to him because I was so scared. Pretty crazy. So fear, <laughs> fear is incapacitating for a lot of us, yeah. but for for other people, the experience of fear like preserves a wonder and mystery about the world. Yeah, that's um, true. That's very so true. there's like there's such a, a two sides of this, I guess. Maybe we need more than one word for the word fear. Ooh, and that's that's a whole. Yeah. That, we do a language episode on how shallow <laughs> our language is and describing things like that. Um, fear. I, I would love that, Jeff. Get it, love. And some people can experience fear. <laughs> which kind of love, Alan? Arrow, that's sir. Right, kind of. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> if you guys couldn't fear. experience fear, what would you do for a living? I would be a superhero. There's actual. There's so. Look it up. And then there's I'd be medical. dead on my first outing. This yeah. is an actual thing. I know. It's an actual thing. There are medical conditions, and no joke, the inability to feel fear is linked to psychopathy. People right. who end up being psychopaths. If you can't feel fear, like there's a lot of connection between that. So. All right. Well, before we derail into <laughs> discussions on serial killers and all that kind of stuff, this has been quite the episode. It ended up being a little bit more combative than I expected, which is awesome. Um, <laughs> It was great. Uh, so, so tell us what you think. Anything from we've got we've covered fear and ghosts and the afterlife and Halloween Demons memories, and angels and the Bible. Yeah, this is our Halloween stuff. special. So tell us what you think at irenacast dot com slash thirty four. And on the other side of the music, we are introducing a new segment called Pursuit of the Trivial. So this week we're introducing a new segment called Pursuit of the Trivial. And essentially we ask a trivial question and we discuss it. Similar to, I guess we could call this like Seinfeldism or something like that, but <laughs> in, in that vein. So I'll start with the question that I proposed and we'll, we'll, that'll kind of give us a feel of how this segment's going to work. So my question is this, is, is a hot dog considered a sandwich? If, if it is. If it if there's any universe where a hot dog is a sandwich, it's at least just an open face sandwich, right? It's something between two breads, so I'm gonna say yes. So I could put a red sandwich in. category. <laughs> so I could put a wrench between two breads and be like, it's a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> is that what my voice sounds like you? It's no. a sandwich. <laughs> Wait. Uh but if someone asked me, Hey, you wanna go get a sandwich? And I was like, sure, and they're like, hot dog, I'd look at them weird. So this is a, a sandwich is not something between two breads. I just want to clarify. Sure. No, well, it's why, not. Why not? It's something <laughs> edible between two pieces of bread. You know what I mean? Oh my god! Otherwise, wait, wait, wait. Otherwise, it's just an analogy to a sandwich. We're talking about the real thing. You could say like, "Oh, we're a people sandwich." When three people are too close, I don't like that joke. But that's anyway. why I say it's a metaphor. Right? It's a metaphor, but we're not talking about. Metaphors. I would like to be in a people. We sandwich. are talking about a literal 
sandwich, not a metaphorical or analogous sandwich. Yeah, but a literal sandwich yes. is with bread. And then everything else is an and analogy to the construction please, of a bread please sandwich. Please use, no, please no. Use the term breads two pieces of bread. Out. Hold on. Two pieces of breads. bread. Two pieces of bread. Breads. breads don't <laughs> make a sandwich. That's not the definition of a sandwich. That's the I'm definition of a loaf. Out. That's a definition of a loaf of bread that's been sliced. No, but right. there has to be something in between it. Exactly. So the stuff in between make the sandwich. Yes, but it's, it's a whole. sandwich when it ha- it's between two pieces of bread. Like for instance, an Oreo, an Oreo is a sandwich cookie because it resembles a sandwich which you're has two pieces of point. bread and something yeah, in the you're middle. Yeah, you're my point. But the stuff in the middle still determines if it's a sandwich or not. No, as, no. just as it, much as no. the two pieces of bread. Its state of no. betweenness determines the sandwich. Yes. But it has yeah, to be so between this of bread. This is a bread around a wrench. You can't call it a wrench sandwich. Yes, you, you can. can. No, you sure, can't. It it's may not, not be not, edible, but you can call it that. But it's not literally a sandwich. It's now an analogy to a sandwich. You know what I'm saying? Yes, but if it was an you edible, wait, if, wait, wait, if, wait, if wait, it was a, if yes. it was a piece of meat shaped like a wrench, then it would be an actual sandwich. I agree. So it has to be edible <laughs> on all ends. <laughs> so our, this got really heated. So. Our um, paninis are sandwiches, but our sandwich. buns, but our hot dog buns, <laughs> two is that basically two pieces of bread or is it one? Bun, oh, I think it's one. So that's my point about the open face sandwich thing. If it's not two pieces of bread, it's not a sandwich. If a hot dog bun is one piece of bread, no. you, really, it, you just it called your it definition. An open- you just called it an open face sandwich. I'm saying if there is a universe where it's a sandwich, <laughs> that's at least what it is, right? But I don't think it is one. Okay, but a sub sandwich is the same thing. Yeah. You go to Subway, they no, slice no. a single piece they of bread. Are subs, not sandwiches. Let me inject a little history, Alan. I'm gonna take I'm gonna take your I'm gonna take your job a little bit. So the sandwich is invented <laughs> by or legend has it, the Earl of Sandwich. This is a real thing. And the reason that he, that he invented this was because he was a poker player and wanted something that he eat with one hand and still play his game without, you know, giving away his hand or everything. So if we go by the origin of the sandwich, then really the sandwich was all about the the, the convenience of being able to eat it with one hand. Okay. So a lollipop a is a sandwich meal. by that definition. You know what I mean? Like, that's ridiculous. No, a lo- <laughs> but that's a, a singular item. No like nutritional value. To add to, basically, to have a okay, meal so in your you're hand. you're saying a burrito is a sandwich. Is it? Or is it a wrap? <laughs> you just said, is it? It's <laughs> not a sandwich. It's a burrito. A burrito pretty- doesn't involve breads. Neither, okay, neither does a hot dog bun. Sure, it Wait, does. Wait, but isn't a tortilla a type buns. of bread? A hot dog bun is no. a, yeah? So if you're going to take Jeff's definition, everything. It doesn't have everything, yeast in it. Under the sun is a sandwich. You know what I mean? If you can eat it with one hand, which is a lot of things, then it's a sandwich. No, it doesn't have the betweenness quality. There has Neither to be does between. a hot dog. Neither does sure. a hot dog. Yeah, the hot dog between is between what? the buns. Yeah, but they're not just two buns. It's one. You don't call it, you hey, have- hey, can you hand me a hot dog buns? No, you say, can you hand me a hot dog bun? Unless you're well, making a joke about someone's you buns. You also say that about hamburger. <laughs> can I have a hamburger bun? You don't yeah. say bun. True. So hamburger's a sandwich then, Alan? Yes. But what? hot dog isn't. Just because it's round. <laughs> All right. So final <laughs> answer. Shapist. Final answer. Hot dog, yes. a sandwich, yes or no? No. Damn. It's a sandwich. <laughs> I'm going to say I'm gonna say yes also. I think it's a sandwich. Okay. Alan loses. Dun, dun, dun. Alan's the voice of rationality. In the <laughs> saying, it's not a demon. It's uh, gravity. Anyway. <laughs> All right, who's who's got their next? I, I have one that happened in real life, and I think I've mentioned it before in passing, not in an episode, but I kind of talked about it before. So I'd, I'd like some help with this one. This is totally trivial, but it means a lot to me. So please help me. I once picked up a sofa with my dad from somebody's house we don't know. My mom said, I'm talking to this person, as my mom usually does, and I'm picking up this sofa for somebody else. So I need you two to go over there and get it. So we go over there. The person's not there, right? Their couch is just sitting out in front of their house. And it has a sheet over it. Okay. And the sheet is like mostly over it. Maybe not all the way. Maybe there's a corner off or something. We pick up the couch. We put it in the back of the car, the back of the truck. And then we think, do we leave the sheet? Do you take the sheet with you? There's no instructions. Nobody answered the door. Do you just like leave the sheet on their front doorstep? We may never see them again, or we don't even know who they are. Or do you just take it with you? Would it be rude to take it or rude to leave it? What do you think? Do you? Do you want the sheet? <laughs> Regardless of what I want, is it rude to take it? I would or say is it that rude to leave it? the appropriate 
thing to do in that situation is take the sheet to protect their couch in the move and then give the sheet to your mom who set up the whole thing anyway and say, you need to handle this. Okay, let's say she's never going to talk to them again. Generally in life, I never give a sheet. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I ask this is it'd be kind of rude if you if you went home and like, I can see somebody coming home being like, they didn't want my sheet. Do they think it was dirty? Like, <laughs> they think it was gross. You know, and it's well, like... And it's like crumpled up on their front doorstep. They, they didn't. Why don't you fold it? You're not even. If you're going to return the sheet, you should at least okay, fold it. Okay, of course, of course. But what if it's not a foldable sheet? What if it's one of those? Uh, I guess you can if fold it's anything. A metal sheet. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I, I would. I would have taken it, and then I would have kept it in my trunk as something that I could use when I move stuff later. I would. Yeah, just, I, would I have agree. Just taken I definitely it. would keep it. If they wanted it back, they would have made it known. They would have left a note. That's why you always leave a note. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. All right. All right. Okay. Here's my question. So when a man is elected president, his wife's called the first lady, POTUS and FLOTUS, right? What would happen if a lady gets elected president and she has a husband? Like if Hillary gets elected, what will Bill Clinton be called? <laughs> I think we should Adam, totally destroy and just keep first lady. This is first lady. Like de-gender, de-gender by first lady. There you go, Absolutely. first lady. It's it's just a historic position. I'm sorry that you're a man, but this is what you're feeling. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, that's I. That's awesome. First gentleman, first man. Nothing works. First man sounds like that. Sounds so misogynistic. Like I'm the first man now. I it sounds know. like a a creation story. The first first man. Hus- the first husband. Oh, so it's first, a, it's first lady. So you'd have to say first gentleman. That sounds so stupid. <laughs> but so does first lady, if you think about it. It does, yeah. Why would you call it the first anything anyway? Like, is she more important than anybody? I don't know. Why is I guess it, so. Where did it come from, first lady? First lady among all ladies. You know what I mean? Yeah, like the... <laughs> okay, so but like the first lady now, yeah. like oversees all the decorations of the White House and all the... Wait, are you ladies. serious? Yeah, seriously, like, That's look so at the, wrong. the historic <laughs> office of the first lady. Like, she has a lot of power. She does a lot of things, but it's all like super domestic. That's so same. I can't imagine Bill Clinton like picking out the ho- holiday decorations and like Martha Stewarting That's the sexist. White House. That's sexist of you. That's really funny. It's so sexist. That's really I funny. know. She has a lot of power. She can raise the children and determine what we're going to eat for dinner. <laughs> like the whole the whole idea is sexist, but if you think about it, like the only way that we're ever going to question is if a man gets in that position. So, like the very like subversion of that whole office is only going to change when a man takes it. That's right. Until it affects us, it's not going to change. Well, I guess the bigger question is if you are handed a tradition, and it's like kind of your job and your purpose, at least the job of your spouse to like celebrate that culture and that tradition and maintain it, then to like flout all the traditions. Like, let's just say Obama just didn't feel like flipping partying a turkey because he thought it was stupid. Like, who gets to decide what traditions are maintained and what tr- traditions get to go? You know, we vote on it. <laughs> well, if, if, if we're going to nail me down, I'm going to say first gentleman. First gentleman. I'm going to say first lady. <laughs> I think Jeff's idea was good. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll change my answer. I'll go with that. I like it too. First lady sounds good. First lady. So we just All keep right. it. Remain status quo. Keep it. Yeah. Lotus. Yeah, yeah, they don't have the right to change that tradition. True. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, because we're not calling. Uh, we're not calling the woman president, president, president anything. President. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, uh, that, that, that means president. if we're going to keep the tradition, we have to call Hillary Clinton Mr. President. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. That's true. This gets so dicey. This is why we can't elect a woman into office. Uh, I think it's a strong argument. <laughs> <laughs> joke. That's a joke. That's a joke, everybody. I did not. Please don't take that as a sound clip. Oh, God. Uh, Just ruined funny. my reputation. <laughs> joke. You thought she was a feminist. Look what she said when she was. <laughs> the real story of this podcast is Mona's de-evolution into That's conservatism right. someday, <laughs> yeah. someday she's gonna have something important to say not that you don't right now that sounds kind of bad <laughs> Thanks, but Sally. we're gonna they're gonna go through your past they're gonna find you one day i'm gonna, gonna run like, for office and they're gonna right. use that clip <laughs> they say a woman she didn't even want this you guys <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right well before we derail even further i think that'll do it for us this week if you like what you hear you can help support the show by going to iTunes and Stitcher to rate, review, and subscribe. And also you can go to our feedback page at irenacast.com slash feedback and 
get a hold of us there. This week, we want to say thank you to Elizabeth on Twitter for contacting the show and just saying, really enjoying your podcast. Always amazing to find someone who puts my thoughts into words. So we really appreciate and are thankful for that feedback. So thank you, Elizabeth. And we want to hear from Aww. the rest of you. Yeah. I feel, I feel the same way. Anytime people say stuff that, you know, articulates my thoughts, I'm always grateful for that. That's cool. Right on. That was awesome. I agree. So that'll do it for us this week. So thank you. Oh, man, I just repeated the whole, I was about to go into the whole spiel again for everyone. <laughs> so you could, um, well, for this week, I'm Jeff. I'm Mona. And I'm Alan. Thanks for joining the conversation. Why do you pause so long, Alan? You like Why do you pause dramatic. so long? I don't pause. I don't pause. I just... Yeah, that was a long pause. I was like, Alan, are you awake?